Welcome to the Rex Andrew Show. Glad to have you with us. If you are a first time listener, welcome to the program. Welcome to the conversation. And we have a couple things to ask for you up front. Number one, don't forget to subscribe. That uh, alert, alerts you to all the new updates. Number two, stop by the show website, rexandrewshow.com, because you can get all the information about all of our guests and uh, the people that are already appeared, today's guest and the upcoming guest. And then the last thing is, I'm not bashful. I will beg. And in fact, I got a caller on today. So I will say I'm a well-dressed beggar. So we'll beg for those stars. So if you think we're doing a good job, give us those stars. It helps us with placement in the app stores. Now, what's wonderful about our program is um, we got a lot of listeners all over the planet. There's so many choices for con content these days for podcasts. There's over 3.6 million podcasts in the marketplace today. And not all of those are active, but that's the big number. So you have a lot of choices. So we like to recognize those people who are tuning in to the program and listening. So I'd like to recognize the listeners who are tuning into the program in Chibu, Philippines. So welcome to the folks in Chibu. Glad to have you on the program with us and listening in. Well, we've been very blessed and not only are we listening to in Chibu in the United States, but we're in 32 countries. And across over 500 cities across six continents. And if I could figure out a way to market to penguins, we probably have uh, some listeners down in Antarctica, but then I'd have to figure out how to help them charge their cell phones. So anyway, um, and do the one last thing I do re recommend everybody do, just the last house cleaning, stop by the show website. When we interview our guests, we get to scratch the surface of their jig, big iceberg, the, you know, who they are. We don't have enough time to cover everything that they're doing. So on the show website, rexandrewshow.com, we have their profiles, information about the guests, links to their uh, online assets and those types of things. So you can get the full story. So sort of the Paul Harvey, get the rest of the story. All right. So enough of the house cleaning, all that good stuff out of the way today. I'm excited about today's guest. Uh, it's taken a little bit to get her on here. She's one busy person, but uh, excited to talk about this topic. Um, we use some of these booking engines and you get to kind of scroll through them. And it's kind of like reading food labels, you know, at the grocery store. What's in this one? What's in that one? Well, this one has some interesting ingredients. So uh, I'd like to introduce her to you today. Um, she's a business psychologist and not a whole lot of people know what that is. I mean, I know I need a psychologist, but who, what's a business psychologist? So uh, we'll talk about that. She's an international best-selling author. So not only is she self-proclaiming uh, that she's smart and cool, she's got people all over the world uh, who are validating that for us. Uh, she's soon to release a new book coming up shortly here, The Four-Week Vacation. I have some people think I'm on a permanent vacation, but uh, we're gonna talk about that today. And she's a keynote speaker and uh, just a wonderful human being. So I'd like to welcome to the program today Coming in to the program from Arkansas, Dr. Sabrina Starling. Dr. Sabrina, how are you? I'm wonderful, Rex. Thank you for that introduction. I, I'm just thrilled to be here and that you have listeners all over the world. And I think you can get some listeners in Antarctica. Don't, don't give up on that. Oh, oh, I have. I had a guest. This was a few weeks ago. They haven't been their uh, interview hasn't been released yet. But she had actually been on some exploration ships down to Antarctica to some of the, the scientific stations. And so when her podcast comes up and says that uh, it was online, she's going to send text messages to all her friends at the uh, research station. So I don't know. I've got my fingers crossed. There's, there could be a chance. There could be a You're chance. You're going to make it happen. Yeah. But the only thing is, I'm not sure if the tracking systems in you know the way the uh, podcast application platforms, I don't know if they'll pick it up from the addresses. So they may just end up in the, uh, you know, the uh, down under uh, section of the world and not just in Antarctica, but we're going to try. We're going to try. Yeah. So glad to have you on the show today. And you know, our show is all about biographies. Success doesn't fall out of the sky. And my whole purpose in doing this is I think that there's, you know, if there's 7.6 billion people on the planet, there's 7.6 billion stories. Mm -hmm. Some are more interesting than others, and some are uh, really interesting. But what we'd like to do is tell those stories because a lot of people, especially um, those who haven't ventured much, uh, think that it's impossible to do something of like that, or they think that everything came easy to people, and it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. So 
What I'd like to do, Dr. Sabrina, with you at this point, and you don't have to worry about um, writing these down. I'll fire these questions out. We want to go back in time. We want to know where you were born. Okay. We also want to know where you were raised. Now, I had a guest on the show, uh, Ellie, Ellie Soja, who actually moved 63 times before the age of 15. Her father was an international con man, and she was in and out of refugee camps and stuff. So huge impact on her upbringing. We also want to know about the things you did as a, as a kid growing up. So what interests you might have had. So possibly, you know, sports or reading, drama, theater, music, shoplifting. And don't laugh. Yes, we had a guest on the show, Larry Cole, by the age of 15, was a car thief. So uh, we want to understand how you were spending your time. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't stealing cars. Um, we don't know about your family dynamics a little bit, if you have siblings, and if you do have siblings, did any of them survive your harassment? We want to know about your parents, okay? Now, parental influence, even as adults, when we're in midlife or, or beyond, that influence is huge. And over my time of entering, interviewing hundreds of people, I have found that there are three big buckets that I classify. The first one is the support bucket. So these are parents that were all in, all engaged, pushed their kids, just had time to be invested in their lives and were really just helping the kids launch to their, to their life. The second one's kind of the intermediate bucket, which I call the non-participatory parent bucket. It's not that they didn't love their kids and they didn't want to support them and help them, but they were so busy eking out a living that they just weren't there all the time. You know, I can remember that my father was a state patrolman, and uh, I don't think he made it to any of my high school football games. So, um, so influences like that. Then there's the struggle bucket. And uh, this is the one I don't like, but it's often a catalyst for helping people grow and have success. This is the bucket where there could be st uh, strife, struggle, addictions, um, extreme poverty, abuse, what have you. And that environment fostered in an attitude of, hey, I don't want to be anything like that, and I'm going to show the world. So we want to learn about that. In addition to your parents, we want to understand what they did for work because that's a big influence. You know, if you're a doctor, it's a good chance your kids might be a doctor <clears throat> and so on. Then we want to hopscotch around your education a little bit and uh, look at some of your points in your journey. Mm -hmm. Then some key pivot points of, you know, what, what got you to where you are. And then we'll talk about all these other great things you got cooking today. And you uh, sound like a typical high performance person, got their hands in several pies. And then I really want to talk about this business psychology business. So uh, if you could, Dr. Sabrina, could you take us back to where you were born? I was born in Alexandria, Louisiana, and I was raised in Alexandria, Louisiana. Okay. We got that out of the way. You're not uh, moving 63 times. Okay. So where is Alexandria? It's in, so Louisiana is shaped like a boot and Alexandria is right in the center. It divides Cajun country from the rest of Louisiana. So you just drive an hour south and you're in Cajun country. Okay. So do you have Cajun influence in your family or are you sort of the uh, north, the northerner type? Oh no. So my, my dad was from Texas, West Texas, and my mother's from Holland. So I, I have no Cajun influence in my family. <laughs> So your, your weekends weren't out uh, hunting down crawdads then, huh? No. And as a matter of fact, I didn't eat crawfish until I was a senior in high school. I was oh, wow. a little bit deprived at, in terms of growing up in Louisiana and missing out on that. Now, I, now I eat crawfish any chance I get. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. So um, what did you do uh, interest did you have outside of school growing up? So when I was a kid, I loved to read. And you know, I, I loved biographies in particular, and I just, mm -hmm. I was fascinated with the biographies of the presidents and the, you know, the women, like the, their wives and the women who made significant changes in history. And I, I kind of like you, I just wanted to hear people's stories and I wanted to understand, I've always been fascinated with why do people do what they do and what are, what are they thinking? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, so that obviously I'm a psychologist, so that kind of just led into where I went with my career. But I also, in what I've become aware of, I, I read a lot of fiction as a kid as well. And I've always been told that I seem to be wiser than my years. Mm -hmm. I really believe it comes from all that reading, whether it's sure. fiction or fiction. And I think my ability to empathize and take the other's perspective comes 
from all that reading. So, you know, as your, as your audience is listening to everyone's story here, you're doing a great thing for boosting your emotional intelligence. Well, th thank you. It. Yeah. I am right there with you being a consumer of biographies. I just was fascinated to study people because as a young kid, I was like, well, how did these people get to where they were in this stuff? And one of my favorite ones is Milton Hershey, you know, the founder of Hershey's Chocolate. Now, nobody in the world would look back now and think that Milton Hershey was a failure. However, Milton Hershey filed bankruptcy seven times in the candy business before he made it to the eighth time and made it successful. Yeah. And he was in his um, mid fifties when he finally got to that eighth, eighth round and was successful. So I just, there are tons of those stories and I could, you know, yeah. I, I, Winston Churchill, one of my favorite ones, he was severely bipolar and a raging alcoholic, but one of the greatest leaders in, in mankind. So biographies are always um, fascinating to me. And, you know, not that we're everyday Joes, because you're not, you know, you're doing great things and you're, you're published around the world and all these good things. But a lot of people just don't know what it takes to get there because, you know, things don't follow the sky. Just a few months ago, we had uh, airplane parts land um, three blocks from my house here, just Whoa. outside of Boulder, when that United Airlines engine blew up and the parts rained down out of the sky. Wow. But, su but success is not like that. The success doesn't land on your house and crush your roof and say, I've arrived. So we like to go back to that. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your, um, now, do you have siblings? I have, I'm an, I was raised as an only child. I have a half brother who's 15 years older than I okay. am. We didn't grow up in the same household. So he was not tortured by me. Okay, um, okay, fair actually, enough. He very well in adulthood. And I think it's probably because we weren't <laughs> raised <laughs> in the same household. <laughs> Well, uh, it's, uh, basically, you know, dealing with sibling uh, uh, strife or support can, can influence people quite a bit. So what type of occupations did your parents do? So my dad was a, a small town community banker and he, mm -hmm. a lot of his customers were small business owners, which has a connection in what I do now. My mother uh, decided to be a stay at home mom when I was born. And, you know, I think something that, it really connects for me is I believe work supports life, not the other way around. Right. And when I was in high school, I dated a young man who broke up with me and his reason for breaking up with me was that I was too ambitious. And his concern was that I would not be a mom who would focus on her, on the children in the household, that I would be more focused on my career. Right. Ouch. You know, I have ambitions, but how do you know what kind of mom I'm going to be? Right. And, you know, I, I take challenges and I took that as a challenge. And it's really, it's kind of shaped who I am because I have been determined to be successful and pursue the things that are important to me. And be, yet, because I had a stay at home mom who really, she poured herself, she continues to pour herself into <clears throat> supporting me and nurturing right. me. My dad's does too. I have become that, that mother. And I found that balance of how do you have a successful business and a life? And that really is the big question that I'm continuing to solve in this world for small business owners is how do you have a business and a life? Because oh. that's, that's a big, a big challenge. And what I saw in my childhood, my dad wasn't a small business owner. My grandfather was though. Okay. And in my dad's childhood, my grandfather owned a string of service stations and drive-in movie theaters in West Texas. Mm -hmm. In my childhood, my dad would work from sunup to sundown and in his job. And then we had a huge yard. My grandparents had a huge yard. So he would work long hours in his job. And then he would come home and do yard work at our house. And then on Sundays, we'd drive over to my grandparents' house and he'd do yard work. He was constantly working. And he would scarf down his food at the dinner table. And he'd rush out the door. And my mom and I, and my mom and I would still be sitting there and I'd be, you know, like halfway through my dinner. Right. And my mom would explain, she said, you know, your dad, this is because of how he was raised. Yeah. He grew up eating out of the concession stands because everyone worked in those drive-in movie theaters in the family. And, yeah. you know, it was the, the business just took over their lives. And that stuck with me and that work ethic stuck with me and all through college and graduate school, it was always work before play. 
and there was, and, and I always, I had the belief that at some point the work would be done and I would get to go play, but that point never comes. Like there's always more work to do. And I remember this point in graduate school where I got to the end of the semester, it was December and I had been sick for three weeks and just plugging away and pushing through. And I was just totally exhausted. And I laid in my bed and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the first time in a few months that I've even paid attention to my body. Like I have a body and it's suffering. I, you know, I'm in pain, I'm miserable, I'm sleep deprived. And I've just pushed been pushing myself through. And that was my first awareness of this way of life is not sustainable. No, it's not. I, I cannot, I cannot go on with that. And, and so in my early twenties, when I got my first job or not my first job, but my first real job outside of part-time work, mm-hmm. I did the same thing. I pushed and pushed and pushed and overachieved. And it was just driving myself into the ground with, you know, just always working. And I remember taking a yoga class because I knew I had to settle down and relax somehow and sure. nothing else was working. And so <clears throat> I took this yoga class and that's really where I learned about like, there is a pause between breaths mm-hmm. and I had never noticed that before. I mean, all of my life I had rushed through the pauses, sure. and, you know, push, push, push. So as I got my first job out of graduate school, I was working really hard. I worked in a community mental health center as a psychologist and I, I got totally burnt out and I decided, you know what, I need to do something differently. And it was also around that time that I was going to start a family. Mm -hmm. That's when I decided I'm going to be, I'm going to have my own business and I'm going to have work-life balance. I'm going to figure this out. And if those of you who are listening to this, if you're small business owners, you know, what a crazy idea it is to think you're going to have a small business, brand new small business and have work-life balance. But Somehow I was determined I was going to make it happen. And then my, my daughter was born and I started my business at the same time she was born. And I just remember I, rocking her to sleep at night, reading business books, trying to learn. And one of the books that I read was Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth. Okay, and yep. The E-Myth, for those of you who aren't familiar with that book in, in the small business world, it is one of the like classics that's all small business owners. Sure. Read. Yeah. And also one that just is eye opening in terms of all the things we're doing wrong in our business, because we need to have systems and we need our business to run without us. And did we- you, um, didn't that come out in the early 2000s, like around 2005 or something? It, well, I think there was an earlier version. So there's the E-Myth and the E-Myth Revisited. Okay. The version okay. I was reading was the Revisited. The Revisited. Version. Okay. There was one before that that was published. So yes, it, it is a, a business uh, must icon type book. You know, you have yeah. to read those. So go ahead. Yeah. And, and so I just, I realized everything I was doing wrong in my brand new baby business. And I thought I have to do something differently. And as a coach, I was, I was going into a coaching business and developing that business. A few years later, I had the opportunity to meet Michael Gerber. Oh, wow. I asked him the question that I had been carrying around with me. And, and that is, you know, for a business, you have a business coaching company. I can't figure out how to scale my, com- my coaching company right. beyond me. And how do you do it? just tell me how you do it. And he looked at me and he said, my dear, I own a coaching company and I have never coached a day in my life. And I am not going to lie to you, Rex, like (laughs) really ticked me off because I know what, what kind of answer is that? You're not telling me anything, but then he was telling me everything. He was telling me that I needed to think very differently about my role in the business. Mm-hmm. And from that, my very being had to shift. And that's what really put me on the trajectory to figuring out that if I'm going to continue to coach, I can never grow a scalable business. And I right. need to figure out how to build a business of coaches. And that's what I have done at Tap the Potential. And at Tap the Potential, what we do is we teach business owners how to take their lives back from their business. 
I have grown Tap the Potential over the course of 15 years now, working on average about 25 hours a week. Nice. I, it is nice. And you know what? I used to be ashamed of that. I used to not want to tell people that story because I thought people were going to judge me somehow that I don't understand them because they're, you know, most business owners are working 70 or 80 hours a week. Right. But what I've learned yeah. is that when we get really clear and focused on what we're doing in our business, there's a lot of things that we're doing that don't matter. Yeah. And focus on the things that matter most that have the greatest impact. Then we can really be intentional with our time. And so I, my personal mission is to teach people how to take their lives back. Yeah. And currently that's with small business owners, but I also know there's a lot of people out there in the world whose work runs their lives. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You that way you, you and I were just talking about how important it is for you. You wanted to be that coach dad. And that's some of the, that drove some of the choices that you made and you made, you found a way to make it work. I believe we all have those opportunities when we declare what's important to us to design our lives and our careers, our businesses around what matters most. Yeah, I agree. You know, after it, it was interesting, I never set out to have five kids, but that happened and uh, raised them all up. And, you know, I had a decade of diapers. I had a decade of running around sports, uh, kind of in the middle of the decade of college, which is very expensive. But you, if you want to have an, a, a rich life, you, you have to make time for those types of priorities because there isn't a company in America that's loyal to anybody anymore. I mean, that's just the way it is. And it's not just America. It's probably anywhere in the Western world. Uh, the expectations for us to work. You know, it's really interesting when you look at South American cultures or European cultures, they think we Americans are nuts. You know, the concept of two or three weeks off is crazy. You know, yes. there, in, certain, in certain countries where you have six to eight weeks uh, off of vacation, some of those mandate that you do take two weeks in a row, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, it's really easy to get uh, swept up in that, um, that corporate culture, that tornado of activity. And then also, too, as a business owner, letting the business own you instead of the other way around. But right. I want to go, I, wanna, I have a couple more questions. I want to hop back for just a second. What did you study in your undergraduate? What did you get your undergraduate in? Psychology. Psychology. Okay. So you went straight on through. So you were right into psychology from the get-go. I, I, once I figured out, so I was that kid in high school where the guidance counselor asked us to raise our hands in our junior or senior year and say what we wanted to do. And I was the one kid that didn't raise my hand because I had no idea what I wanted to do. And when I took my first introduction to psychology course, it was like, wow, I've landed. Holy smokes. This is my cup of tea. Wow. I mean, I took it in summer school. Okay. I read the entire textbook before the class started. That's not my typical mode of operation. <laughs> and, I was going to say, kind of um, maybe you should take your temperature right about now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I was, it really went back to, I was just so darn curious and I've always been so curious about people and why we do what we do and, and the choices that we make, like what drives us. Right. And so I, I started out in psychology and there was a moment in time, a blip where I almost switched over to business because I'm fascinated with business as well. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I stuck, the, I stuck with psychology and, um, went to graduate school in counseling psychology and got my doctoral degree. Okay. So, and then you, right out of school, you went to work for a community mental health center then? Yeah. Okay. I, I had a, a wild hair. Um, all of my, I, I went to the university of Texas at Austin for graduate. Okay. And Austin is a very fun place to live and go to graduate school. Oh, it's awesome. Awesome town. Highly recommend it. And at the same time, as I was wrapping up my doctoral program, all of my friends started taking jobs and moving across the country. And then all of a sudden, Austin wasn't so much fun anymore without my friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to go off and have one more life adventure before I settle down. Right. And I had been to Colorado. I had seen the Rocky Mountains and I thought it would be really cool to live in the Rocky Mountains somewhere. And I, I was tired of Austin. I was tired of the traffic in Austin and the growing city. And I thought, I want to try small town living. 
And I heard about a program called the National Health Service Corps, where they would pay off your student loans if you would go work in an underserved rural Me, area. Sure, yeah. And I thought, this is the ticket. I have a lot of student loans. Let me go off and have an adventure, live in the Rocky Mountains, get my student loans paid off. And then, you know, I'll go on with my life. It's two years. I'll go have some fun. Well, I ended up in a little town, Riverton, Wyoming. Okay. Yes. Know where Riverton is. Been there. Off the Wind River Range. Yep. Um, it's a couple hours southeast of Jackson Hole. Mm-hmm. So um, ended up being there for five years. But I worked... Wow. I worked in community mental health in a very underserved area and a lot of poverty. Um, it, it was eye-opening in, in terms of just different walks of life and life experiences. Now, I've been through Riverton, but not long enough to, to make a determination. Is it constantly windy in Riverton like the, most of the rest of the state? No. No, okay. <laughs> no, but it is windy. Yeah. And like the first, when we first moved there, the first week we had 70 mile an hour winds come through and knock down the fence in the backyard. So oh my goodness, yeah. But it was not constant. There's some parts of the state where the wind just blows nonstop. Nonstop. You know, we, as a Colorado and we always, and, and the funny part is uh, the second part of the joke, I'll get to a minute. My family's actually originally from Nebraska. They homesteaded in Nebraska, both sides of my mom's fam- mom and dad's family. But my, they escaped Colorado, thank goodness. Heads was Omaha, tails was Denver. And now I say, thank God for tails. Um, but the joke here in Colorado is this is, you know why it's windy in Wyoming, don't you? No, what? Because Nebraska sucks. <laughs> and the wind only comes one direction. It's going west uh, to east. You know, it's just coming across there. So anyway. So, wow, what, a, what an adventure in Riverton. There's no 6th Street in Riverton. Oh, no, there's not. And I, we would, so you might also know this, that when you live in Riverton, Wyoming, you fly out of Denver because it's yes. like expensive. So that's a six hour drive. And so there were many times that I was traveling and I would drive down to Denver and fly out and then come back. And I would be driving back out of Denver, getting into Wyoming, and I would just start crying because I missed the food, I miss the restaurants, I miss yes. the culture of Austin. Right life, yeah. And those sorts of things. And so there was a huge, a huge adaptation. And I, I really have come to appreciate so much about Wyoming and Riverton, but the, the change from the big city culture was, it was big, it was hard. Yeah. Now, how big of a town was Riverton at the time when you were there? Um, so, if I, if I recall this correctly, the county itself, Fremont County, which incorporates yep. Riverton and Lander, which are the two bigger towns, it, the population is about 10,000. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand. The entire state of Wyoming is just roughly over 500,000 people. Yeah. Uh, it's an enormous state, but it's just, you know, it is as rural as going to get. So um, now, did you have your daughter uh, at that time, too, when you went to Riverton? She was born after. I okay. Years. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. That is a, that is a cultural difference. Austin, Texas to Riverton, Wyoming. Yes. And uh, did they get a decent amount of snow in Riverton? Just helping our, our listeners understand. Yes, absolutely. So there's, a, you know, Boulder and Denver in that area get snow and then it melts and you have a lot of sunshine. So there's a lot of sunshine in Riverton. We would get snow and then it would melt. Um, and then there were also times when there would be an Arctic, and I can't remember the right word for it, but it's basically where the cold air comes and it stays and it would be like down to minus 10 or minus 20 mm. consistently for you know days weeks at a time yeah so you know there's some very scary weather conditions that can happen there so looking back what was the best part about riverson friends 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 that i made uh, you know i have a life a best friend that i would consider a lifetime friend that i made there in riverton um, i still have clients that are part of tap the potential that or help me start my business there. I started my business in Riverton, Wyoming. Fantastic. What, I, year, what year was this when you started? Okay, so <laughs> I'm not good with numbers here. My daughter is 15. So I started the business officially the year before she was born. So it was 16 years ago. This is 2021. So I'm going to say it was 2005. Okay, yeah. Wow. That's, uh, you didn't have the best internet connections at that time either. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> 
a little more than dial up. Remember the 14.4s, and then we thought we were really cool when we had 28.8. But uh, I'm guessing that broadband wasn't uh, available everywhere in Riverton at that time. No, it wasn't. And a lot of what we did was over teleconferencing and, and over the phone at that time. Coaching calls happened over the phone. Um, and, you know, even cell phone reception back then was horrible. There were a lot of dead spots and sure. coming from Austin, everyone had cell phones and they were tied to their cell phone. And after we moved to Riverton, we didn't have a cell phone probably for three or four years because there was just no point. Yeah. To have that. Fantastic. So after uh, your experience in Wyoming, being a cowboy for a while, you know, out there in the great state of the Cowboys, uh, what was your next pivot? Well, and then I moved back to Alexandria, Louisiana. Okay. And that was that was an unexpected pivot, um, and it was more of a, a gut moment of like this is the thing to do, and I I need to do it. So my husband and I had gotten divorced, and I was content. I loved Wyoming. I love the outdoors there, and I really thought I would be staying. But I had gone to visit my parents with my with my daughters, and we were. Leaving. <clears throat> And the morning that we were leaving, my parents' neighbors called and the neighbor lady said to my mom, I just feel like I need to tell you this and I don't know why, but I want to let you know that very soon in the next few months, my husband and I are going to put our house on the market. Mm. And I heard my mom on the phone say, oh, well, thank you for telling us, you know, we might want to buy that because we've looked at the house over the years and thought we might like to have it. Sure, my sure. mom ended that phone call and she turned to me and told me about, you know, the, 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 the house. Who sell the house. And I said, you know, I might want to buy it. And it was one of those moments where the words were out of my mouth before I could stop them. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I was just like, oh, did I really just say that? Right. And and the full implications of moving back home <laughs> and had not, did not register in my mind and, and what that would be involved. But what I, what I, the reason that house appealed to me so much is because I had had in mind for quite some time that I would love to have a retreat center to bring our business owner clients to. We've been putting on retreats already, but how mm -hmm. cool would it be to have a really nice home to be able to do retreats with our clients at my home? And that house offered that opportunity. And that's, that's what made me move on it. So that home became the Entrepreneur's Retreat Center. And we've hosted five or six breakthroughs on the Bayou events there for small business owners over the years. Fantastic. So tell me now, I want to dive into this a little bit. We get, we'll hopscotch around a little bit. What the heck is a business psychologist? Well, that's a really good question. So there's lots of business coaches out there. Oh yeah. You, you so, could pave, pave the streets of Colorado with uh, business coaches. Absolutely. absolutely. So I, I wanted to be unique. I, I didn't want to be thrown into a bucket because what I do is unique. I use my skills as a psychologist to help business owners be more successful. Okay. Um, so, you know, when, when we're working with business owners, we're looking at who they are, who, what are their, what are their personality strengths and what are they, you know, if they're going to bring their gifts to bear in the business and create the greatest value in the business, it's going to come when they work from their strengths. Mm -hmm. and how do they connect with their team and how do they build a great place to work and what even goes into creating a great place to work. And what I, what I had when I transitioned from being a psychologist to what I started out as a life coach is I had a lot of small business owners reaching out to me and asking me to help them with their employee problems. Hmm. And so that's where the business psychologist came in because that's what I was talking to them all the time about is how to deal with the people problems, the drama in the business. And I can't, if I had a dollar for every business owner that told me I'm so sick of the drama, <laughs> put an end to the drama. I would be a very wealthy woman right now. Yeah. And, and so when I started digging in with them around what was going on, I realized they really had a hiring challenge that when it comes to, when you're a small business owner, oftentimes it feels like you can't get the best team members and you just kind of have to make do. Well, a lot of my clients were in Wyoming. Um, and so I would hear like, we're in a small town, this is a rural area. We're just gonna have to make do. So Dr. Sabrina, would you please just use your psychology to teach me how to coach my team and right. get these warm bodies, really great employees. And 
I'm going to tell you, I coached very good business owners who had great leadership skills, great coaching skills. They could not turn their warm body team members into A players. I couldn't do it either. It cannot be done. Right. And the only solution is to know how to hire A players. And that's what really, that's what led me to write my book, How to Hire the Best. And the first version of that book was written specifically for rural business owners to help them with their hiring challenges. And the crazy thing was, is after that book was published, I started getting phone calls from business owners in all parts of the country, Denver, San Francisco, New Jersey, New York. And they, they would all start off with saying, Dr. Sabrina, I know I don't have a rural business, but maybe you could help me because I have these hiring problems too. Right. And that's what led me to really digging in and figuring out, well, can the solutions that I found in how to hire the best, can those help other business owners? Maybe what I've thought was a rural problem is not a rural problem. Maybe it's a problem overall. Mm-hmm. And so I, I got, I'm really smart in terms of paying attention to where the greatest interest is. So of all the people who were calling me, what industry were they were? were they in? And that's what I started digging into. They were in construction. Oh, okay. Construction has some of the biggest hiring challenges out of Uh. industries. And so I, the next version of how to hire the best was the for the construction industry. So how to hire the best, the contractor's ultimate guide to attracting top performing team members. When that book came out, crazy thing that happened with that. That's the one that became the international bestseller, which I thought that's absolutely crazy. I never expected that. Right. Um, but I also, part of what made that a bestseller is that people were publicizing the book who were not in the construction industry. I had accountants, I had real estate, wow. companies, I had people in other industries sharing the book in their social media, in their networks and with their friends saying this stuff works, forget that it says contractor on the front. It works across, it works in my business. It works. You need to use this. And so the book that I've always wanted to write is the four week vacation. And so I put that book on hold for yet another (laughs) year. (laughs) So, so um, what years did you publish the first two? I don't know, Rex. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Um, I, let me think, let me do a little math here. I'm going to say that the first one probably came out maybe, I'm going to say five years ago. So like 2016 mm-hmm. in, that, in that range. And then the second one was a couple of years later and then how to hire the best the entrepreneurs edition. I know for sure that one came out in 2020 because that was recent. I remember. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Um, and so the four week vacation is what's coming out in October of 2021, but the, the, the one that I published last year was the entrepreneur's ultimate guide to attracting top performing team members in in the, how to hire the best series. And that was just because I saw entrepreneurs, regardless of industry needed that book. And if they were, if they were going to Amazon and they were searching and they saw a book that said rural business owner, or they said, Contractor, they were just immediately disqualifying it. Right. And so the latest book in the series, I really consider like the, the mothership of, of the series, because I've, every time I publish that book, I learn more and more. I have more conversations with a variety of business owners across industries and I learn what works and what doesn't work. And what astounds me, there's a couple of things. This is the only book that's out there that's written for small business owners on hiring. There's lots of books on hiring that are out there, but they're written for a corporate audience. Right, and right. A small business owner without an HR department, it's very hard to implement those strategies. How to mm-hmm. hire the that overworked small business owner, the, the, the HR department of one, essentially. And so it's very grassroots, like here are the simple things to do that works. But the other thing that amazes me is we are all doing things that we believe we're supposed to do when it comes to hiring and they are ineffective and they actually set us up to mishire 75% of the time. And it's because we're just all doing what's been done to us. We, you know, when we've gotten a job, somebody had to submit an application and they interviewed us and we apparently did good with the interview because we got hired. And so that's how, when we go to hire as a small business owner, we take that same approach. Oh, I need to hire somebody. Let me write an ad. Let me collect some applications and resumes. I'll look through those, pick the best of the ones that come in, interview, pick the best out of the people that I interview and then hire. 
And yet we're constantly astounded by the quality of the applications that we get, the lack of the applications that we get, especially right now with COVID and, and what's going on with small business owners and hiring. And when, what we end up doing is trying to pick the best of the worst. Well, t- quality team members, A players, don't respond to help wanted ads. They're not reading help wanted ads. They're no. not walking through storefronts and saying, oh, they need help. I'm going to go submit an application. Right. Players move from one opportunity to the next. So we need to design how we hire as small business owners around the psychology of A players. And that's what the How to Hire the Best series is about, is understanding the psychology of A players and how to really be an employer of choice and what it means to create a great place to work. I I genuinely believe there's a lot of business owners that really want to be a great place to work. And they just lack the skills. No one's yeah. shown them how. And if you have some know-how, you can do it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, being in tech uh, over the last 34 years, um, a critical mistake that a lot of startups would make is hiring people who are available, not the people who were the talented ones and or mismatches in culture. And if you only have a few million dollars or that you've raised and you're doing these things, one or two key critical mistakes in hiring can tank your entire company. It absolutely can. Mishiring yeah. is the, one of the most costly mistakes you can make in business because if you have a, a team member that you're paying $30,000 a year, you bring them on and you train them even for a little bit of time and then you lose them, it can cost you up to three times that salary. So that's $90,000. Yeah. If you have hundred thousand dollar a year team member and you oh. lose three hundred thousand dollars in in cost of training onboarding someone again having to recruit them and not to mention when you have people who are a bad fit for your culture they drive away your best clients and customers oh so, absolutely or yeah, this- your best other employees so if you get absolutely. a rotten rotten bear apple in the barrel they can poison it and no matter what you do they the other employees leave and then you're stuck with a bad apple and yeah it can be very very detrimental i have seen i could report, repeat story after story where mishires were made in early stage companies and it pretty much just tanked them you know yeah. just or, or set them so far back that they were years or, or more multiple years behind where they should have been just because they were trying to recover because they hired somebody's brother-in-law or they hired somebody that they knew this or, or they brought somebody along from another entity that they'd been in, but they weren't a fit for this one. Yeah. So, yeah. And the majority of small businesses are not profitable. And the reason they're not profitable is because of this very problem that we're talking about. It is so costly when you miss hire, there's so much on the line. And there's, there's a lot of business owners out there that will say they have hiring PTSD or employee PTSD because they're so beaten down from these bad experiences. And really what I want every small business owner to know is that when you learn how to hire based on hiring a players and their mentality, you can shift that percentage from 75% chance of mishiring to 50% down to 25%. So you can get better and better at your hiring. It's just like anything else in life that we do. Sure. Once someone shows us the, you know, if we're playing tennis and we're not getting the ball across the net, you have a coach that comes along and says, you know, hold your arm this way and, and follow through by goodness sakes, that will right. get it all the way across. Once you do learn that and you practice it and you do it over and over, you get better and better. And it's the same thing with hiring. It just takes learning some skills and learning the psychology of a players. Uh, real quick, because there are people who kind of play along with this. Throw out a website or social media, LinkedIn, whatever. Where do people connect with you to talk about uh, following up on this? Because it's a huge problem. The best place you can find me is on our website at tapthepotential.com. Okay. I'm also on LinkedIn as Dr. Sabrina. So just at Dr. Sabrina. And Tap the Potential is on Facebook. And Dr. Sabrina Starling is on Facebook as well. Okay. So I'd love to Thank you. Now, um, you have some courses. We talked about this a little off air before we were coming on. Tell me a little bit about the courses and the programs you have available for people. Yeah, so I have a course based on the How to Hire the Best series. It's called How to Hire the Best. 
and it is a five week course. And I love what I love about this course is we let people take it over and over and over. Cause it's really that opportunity to keep honing and refining your skills. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, so we pay for it once and you just take it multiple times. I do live Q and a as the course is running. So you get to meet with me and I will help you with what you're working on and you get to Mm -hmm. learn from participants and we really break it down to what you need to do to be an employer of choice. So when you sign up for that course, your mission, if you choose to accept it is to become an employer of choice. So you attract a steady stream of A players to your business. So with your techniques and the strategies that you teach and coach, are you really able to get to a systematic uh, hiring process that's nothing's ever 100% foolproof, but is that what you're really trying to teach them is the, the system and the approach? Absolutely. We have business owners. So right now with COVID, you probably know across the, I know you have listeners all over the world. So in the United States, small business owners are really struggling to hire right now, particularly in the service industries. If you go out to a restaurant, there'll be a sign up that says, please be nice to our staff because we are understaffed and they are, you know, they're covering and doing all they can. You know, don't run, don't run those staff off too. And, and so in these very same industries I, I, where, that are struggling to hire, I have clients who are succeeding in hiring. I have one who's used the How to Hire the Best system for the last three years in his mm-hmm. business. He has hired nine team members in the last six months. Wow. And none of them came from reading a Help Wanted ad. Sure. They were all employed elsewhere before they came to work for him because he's positioned himself as an employer of choice. As an employer of choice. You know, it's always funny when uh, I was growing up and a young man and talked about dreams and ambitions with friends, a lot of them went, oh, I want to have a restaurant. And I'd look at them and I'm like, are you kidding? Do you want to chase around somebody like you or me for the rest of your life and your, your income depends on that? You know, because dealing with entry-level um workers and nothing against that. Heck, I worked at you know, tons and tons of those types of jobs growing up. Um, that I, I can't even imagine having to deal with something like that. And I would think in my mind, I mean, your system applies everywhere, but that would seem to be one environment with such a heavy turnover just from the, the stage of life that those you know, entry-level workers are at, that a system would just have almost have to be a must to be able to survive. Absolutely. And, and it's the system built around being an employer of choice. And I had a conversation with a business owner three weeks ago and, and he's in the food service industry, fast food. And he said, he's not having any problems with hiring. And I said, he's not a client. Okay. Cause okay. I can't credit for this one. I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, we have just a reputation that this is the place to work. And I said, Oh, employer of choice. He said, yeah, we're an employer of choice. We have, we hire high school students. And when they go off to college, the family has other kids coming up behind them. They want them to come to work for us because right. we, have a great place. we support the families and the family's interests. Yeah. We had that situation with my kids growing up. Um, Two of my kids have actually worked at Chick-fil-A's with very, very um, good franchise owners and treated them like gold and just made it so it was a place where the kids didn't, you know, it wasn't a drudgery to go to work. And they paid better than most of the other type fast food jobs and those types of things. And so, yes, you really can establish that if you get the uh, right approach and things. Yep. Uh, what's the biggest, just a quick nugget for those who are listening today. Um, what's the, one of the biggest mistakes an employer will make? So one of the biggest mistakes is not paying attention to your core values as an employer and okay. calling them out and identifying them. The number one thing that you can do to increase your odds of hiring right is to identify what we call immutable laws, but they're based on your core values. And then be intentional about attracting people to apply whose core values align with yours that your core values become the seeds of the culture Mm -hmm. and you will have team members who will be loyal to you who will want who will do the right thing even if there's not a system for what to do if their core values align with yours so a lot of times we will go out and we will look for hiring through skill set and it's not about hiring for skill sets. Skills can be trained. Sure. Core values cannot be trained. 
the only way to train core values is by raising up your A players from the, from the cradle. And that's in the home. You can't bring them in at 17 or 30 and teach them. These work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> work ethic is the word that's used. Yeah. That is something they come to with. They either have it or they don't. All right. So, you know, the world is full now. The concept of one ads doesn't even exist in most areas in the country anymore. All these job boards. Is, yeah. it, is it important how people write their listings on those job boards? Yes. Uh, and especially, you know, I'm not thinking about C-level or management level, people who are making 7,500 and up type, you know, you find those through networks. Those are, that's where you find those people. But we're talking about, let's go back to the example of the, the food service industry or a service industry, a plumber or, you know, um, tell us a little bit about how, what's the key to putting out the right message in a listing so you can attract the right um, candidates. Then the number one key is to be different. If you go on to Indeed and you start reading ads, they all start to sound the same. Oh, yeah. And, and so they're not really speaking to the A player. So you want to call out who you're talking to in the ad with, are you the kind of person who, and you, if you think through the role that you're hiring for and you think through, okay, if this person in this role can only get one thing done in a given day or a given week. What is the one thing that I need them to do that's going to have the greatest impact on the business in terms of, you know, the sweet spot of our business and the profitability? Mm -hmm. You need to identify what that one thing is. And then you think through the personality strengths needed to consistently deliver that one result exceptionally well, day in and day out. And so I'll give you an example of that. I had a client who was in college and he had developed a food product and he had a kiosk in a mall and he was selling his product in the kiosk and he was getting a lot of sales and he was getting really busy and he needed some help. So he started hiring his buddies and he couldn't understand why he would hire his buddies and they would do a great job of bringing foot traffic over and they would do that for the first hour or two of the day. But then as the day wore on, they would actually sometimes turn their back on the foot traffic and they'd be on their phones. And he said, I don't get it. These are, you know, these are great students. They work hard in school. Why? And they, they seem like they do a good job for a little bit with me, but then they sour and they're my friends on top of it. He said, I don't understand what's going on. And I said, let me ask you a question. When you go to a party with your friends, are they like in the center of things and, you know, talking and mingling with everyone? Or are they more like off to the side? And he said, oh my gosh, they don't do parties. Like I can't get them out of the apartment to go to parties. They, they just want to stay home and study. I said, I think your friends are introverts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think you have hired introverts for a role that requires extroverts. Right. And I what you're seeing is when they're turning their back on the foot traffic in the mall, it's their batteries are drained and they are trying to recharge their batteries sure. to be that extrovert who calls people over to your food kiosk. And so every role that we hire for has a critical result. And his critical result is he just needed people to get foot traffic over to his kiosk. That was right. the one they didn't do anything else. So he needed to hire people who have a personality strength to do that exceptionally well day in and day out. Those are going to be extroverts because extroverts get energized by sure. people interaction. Right. Introverts were getting drained. So we need to think through that for every role that we hire for. What, what's the one thing we need them to do? And what are the personality strengths that set them up to do it exceptionally well day in and day out? And then when we write our ads, we want to call that out and say, you know, for in his example, it would be, are you someone who gets energized by dealing with people? Would it excite you to be having a lot of conversations with people and sharing our product with them and, to, and you know, inviting them to taste something really yummy? And that's, that's kind of how you start off the ad. And so you start just speaking to them and then you also call out the immutable laws in the business and, and say, this is who we are and how, how we do things. If this sounds like it's you, you might be a good fit. That's fantastic. So Tell me a little bit about the, the four week vacation that's on the horizon. What's, what's that all yeah. about? So, you know, when I was working with those business owners and helping with their hiring challenges, 
the reason I was doing that is because I really wanted to help them get their lives back in their businesses. And I thought when I first started this work that small business owners just had a work-life balance problem and that they just needed help understanding that you don't have to work so hard. You can, you can have a high quality of life. Well, that's not what they needed. They get that. The reason they don't have good work-life balance is because they can't get the team members that they need right. so that they can be away from their yeah. business and right. have team that support them. So the four week vacation is really about how you design a sustainably profitable business that gives you more time for what matters most and more money in your bank account than ever. It hinges on knowing how to hire the best. So I had to solve that problem first for business owners before I could write the four week vacation. If you yeah. don't hire a great team, you can't build that business that doesn't depend on you. Yeah, that and that and that also too. It extends then to you ever want to sell that business. Oh. If you can't step away from that business and it not function, then it's highly unlikely if you were to sell that business that someone else is going to be able to make it successful because it was too dependent on you. It's almost like having a personality business. You know. Yes, it, it, it's really it difficult. It really is, and so you have a business that depends on you. It has no value. Yeah. And that's a terrible thing to put your whole life's energy into creating what you believe is an asset. So many small business owners believe their small business is their retirement plan. And then when they get close to retirement, they realize no one wants to buy this. Right. It's because they have a very low paying job. Most business owners. Oh, yeah. Themselves well, and they're working 70 to 80 hours a week. So what kind of proposition is that to a potential buyer? Come work, come pay me to buy this business. And then you're going to work 70 to 80 hours a week. Oh, and by the way, you might make less than minimum wage. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Until you might take your annual bonus and even that you may have still not. So, um, right. So I know you're a go-getter. So what's next on the horizon after this book? What's, what's the next BHAG you have cooking? You know, what, what's coming out of the four week vacation is when I talk about this, the, the biggest aha, the people who light up the most, the business owners get excited about it. The people who light up the most are the team members in these small businesses. Mm -hmm. And I, what I really want is I want to educate the world about that you can be effective. You don't have to work so hard to be effective. I want business leaders to hear the message that, you know, psychologically to get the most out of knowledge workers and most of this, uh, many people these days are in the knowledge world, mm -hmm. about a five hour work day, not eight, 10, 12 hours. We peak at our effectiveness after about three to four hours. Mm -hmm. And so there's a different way to do business. And we've all learned that through COVID we've all adapted. We've learned there's other ways to do business there's more effective ways to do business and there's more effective ways to have businesses that support our lives. And so I believe what's next is really championing the message that work supports life and the way we do work in the United States is messed up. It is. It really is. You know, one thing I tend to just because a little bit of my ADD, ADD nature, which nobody even calls that anymore, but um, I have my hands in a couple different pies and I have learned that if I work two or three hours intensely on this project, set it aside, then my ADD kicks in and I can go work on this project for two or three hours, set it aside, and then do another two or three hours here. I can actually be extremely effective in moving those three forward and not be burnt out on any one of them because I've just put in these small, intense uh, sessions with those, or don't touch it for a couple of days after that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, we really do need to rethink that. And, you know, different strokes for different people. People have different uh, behavior patterns and habits and those types of things. But for me, I've always been a short burst worker. That's just the way I've been. And uh, that, I guess that's kind of fostered my love of being in sales and business development and marketing is, you know, you, you don't spend all day on one client and those types of things. You go off and you do other things. And so it, it kind of gives you a little variety. Yeah, the variety you need. So you have figured out your personality and how you work best. I think we all need to figure that out for ourselves and we need guidance in doing that. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, it, it's, this is the way it's always been done. So we're doing it this way without consideration for, well, what's possible? What, what would be better 
for us. I I'm a morning person. And if I'm going to write a book, it's going to get written in the morning. It's not going to happen at eight o'clock at night. Right. So, you know, these are things that I've learned to pay attention to and we can all do that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, thanks for coming on today. It's been fascinating. Um, put out your website again so people can find you. Tapthepotential.com. Okay. And then um, I have one last question I ask all my guests. And uh, it's kind of a left-handed question. In the Western world, in the Western cultures, we run into this thing called a bucket list. And in fact, I have interviewed the bucket list guy. Is the bucket list guy.com. Trav Bell, he's in Melbourne, Australia. Interesting person lives a purposeful life. It's a, he's a great, great story. Great interview. Anyway, episode 60, but that bucket list of the things we want to do before we, our time is done, but there's always an opposite of everything in the universe. So there's an opposite list of things that we don't want to do or don't have any interest to do it again. Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show. So I'm not going to say that. So it's the effort list. Okay. So what might be an item or two that would be on Dr. Sabrina's effort list? Now, I'll give you some, uh, some samples like from me. I'm never going to have a collection of pet snakes. Just not going to happen. Um, I'm not eating any more caviar or sardines. Those are just off the, the or, or monkey brains. None of those count anymore. And then the one I did an episode on and shared the horrible experience is I will never, ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. The, <laughs> I, the idea of excessive heat, excessive humidity, excessive drumming and chanting all at the same time and a slice of nudity, I'm not doing that again. So what might be an item or two that is on Dr. Sabrina's effort list? I have two that immediately come to mind. So number one is never ever again will I get on Space Mountain at Disney World. <laughs> I ended up on that ride when I was seven years old and it terrified me. I had no idea I was getting on a roller coaster <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> yeah. A roller coaster in the dark. Great concept, huh? Yeah. And so I went back in my thirties and thought I would try it again. Cause maybe now I'm older and bigger and I know what I'm getting into and it'd be okay. And it was worse. It was worse. <laughs> so never, okay. never again. All right. Um, so we're, you're not going to be spending four hours in line at that at Disney world. Well, okay. No, no, no. And the other one that I will never do again is install a metal roof in Wyoming oh, in my goodness. because it's freaking cold and you can't wear gloves and your fingers get cut up and the wind picks up and blows the metal off the roof while you're trying to get uh, it secured. <laughs> Not happening. Not happening. Well, those are great. In fact, the metal roof in Wyoming, that's, uh, that's, I've never heard that one before, but <laughs> now that I have, uh, that would make sense. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the ranch in Nebraska uh, doing crazy uh, projects like that and no thank you. So. Well, thanks for coming on. It's been a great to, uh, to learn about your story, learn more about you and what you're up to. I think you're doing some tremendous work because, you know, small business has it difficult in the first place because a lot of people are artists or craftsmen or something, but they don't have the business skills. And so when they get to that point where they need to add help, boy, they can just, you know, shoot themselves in the head practically by making those wrong choices. So I think you're doing great work. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share yeah. my story. Fantastic. Well, folks, until next time, we are, thank you for tuning in. Uh, please visit Dr. Uh, Sabrina's uh, websites. And then also too, you can always find her on the show website at rexandrewshow.com. Uh, again, we recommend you stop by there because there's uh, full histories and, and links and you can get a lot of more information that we don't have time to cover today. So until next time, we will say what we always say at the end of every episode, be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.